Good afternoon. Look, we're very spaced out. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome. Yeah. All right, we're going to call the get, call to order this joint study session of the City Council, Federated City Employees Retirement Board, and the Police and Fire Department Retirement Board the afternoon of March 30th. Tony, would you please call the roll? Jimenez? Torres? Present. Cohen? Ortiz? Present. Davis? Here. Cohen? Here. Candelas? Here. Foley? Batra? Present. Kame? Mahan? Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate everybody taking the time for this study session. I know it's going to be very informative. You all are doing one of the most important jobs, which is making sure that we are meeting our obligations to our retirees and, and taking care of those who have served the city and its residents. So really looking forward to the discussion and, and learning together. I know we are kicking off with item one on our agenda, which is an introduction to San Jose pension and OPEB funding. And I apologize, I'm not clear who I'm turning it over to, but who's giving the presentation, the first presentation? Um, Mayor Mahan, good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are happy Take to be here. Um, so the pre first presentation is by uh, Bill Holmar, who is our actuary from Chiron uh, Actuary Firm. He intended to be here this afternoon, but his plane got delayed, so he's now reporting or presenting remotely. Okay. Uh, Bill, are you there with us? Can you hear me? I am. Can you hear me? Not only can we hear you, we can actually so see you. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to sh share my screen here. Hopefully, you can uh, uh, now see my presentation. Yeah, we got it, Bill. Good job. All right. Well, uh, thank you for the flexibility to present via Zoom. Uh, I had, was really looking forward to actually getting to see everyone in person, but uh, I guess uh, we've now learned to uh, present through Zoom and communicate through Zoom, so that's what I'll have to do today. Uh, with the agenda materials, you got a PDF copy of this presentation. I just wanted to point out that on the first page of that PDF copy, there's an actual link that goes to a Chiron website where you can see the interactive version uh, that I'm going to be presenting. Uh, so you can either follow along or if you're uh, really into pension funding, you can uh, look it up later uh, and play around with some of the numbers in here. Uh, I would also uh, encourage you to uh, stop me and ask any questions if there's something on a particular slide that you don't understand. I, I know that uh, most of you do not spend a lot of time working with pensions and so, I hope the presentation is clear, but let me know if there's uh, anything not clear. Of course, we can take questions at the end as well. Bill, this, Bill, this is, is Roberto. Roberto. I apologize for stopping you, and I apologize to the mayor and the council, but um, this is also an open uh, public meeting for the boards, and they need to take roll call as well. I forgot to mention sure. that. So if, 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 if you don't mind, if we can do that for a second. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I apologize. Uh, Drew and Spencer, if you can start with police and fire first, take the roll call and then the federated. Thank you. Great. Franco? Here. Sunita? Here. Dave? Here. David? Wilson here. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Juan, you're here? Here. Here. Uh, Dick, you're here? Here. And I'm Drew Lanza. Andrew Gardner is on duty today and our trustees, Eshvar Menon. Um, and Howard Lee, our at the CalPERS conference. Thank you, uh, Roberto. Thank you, uh, Spencer. If you could do the same for Federated, thank you. Certainly. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings. Trustee Sandra. Here. Trustee Kelleher. Here. Trustee Linda. Here. Trustee Obasi. Here. And I am here. Thank you both, uh, and, and thank you to the council and the mayor and, uh, and the city clerk. And if I can turn it over to uh, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Um, so as I get into the presentation, uh, I hope that there are a couple themes that kind of come through. Uh, 
San Jose's pension and OPEB plans have about two thirds of the assets that they should have uh, at this point. That shortfall is largely a legacy problem uh, attributable to funding uh, the benefits for members who mostly no longer work for the city. The boards, the retirement boards have put together uh, some strong policies to restore funding uh, through both contributions and investment returns, um, but that will likely take some time. And so we'll, we'll show you some of that. And um, the biggest variable in those plans is, is what future investment returns turn out to be. So to start off, uh, all four plans, two pension and two retiree medical plans combined have about $7.7 billion in assets. They should have 11.7 billion. So they're about $4 billion short in, in aggregate. Uh, now there's a significant variation between the plans. Here you can see, uh, the pension plans are clearly the largest. Uh, the OPEB or retiree medical plans are relatively small uh, in comparison. The federated pension has a, a $2 billion unfunded liability. The police and fire pension, $1.2 billion. Uh, police and fire is 78% funded and the federated pensions 57% funded. Now, if we compare those to other California plans, uh, as of 2022, each one of these uh, dots represents another California plan. Uh, and you can see that the federated plan is the lowest funded plan in California, and police and fire uh, is in the, the lower half, but up in the, the more of the mainstream uh, with its 78% funded. Now, they weren't always that way. So if we go back in time uh, to 2007, the federated plan at that time was 90% funded and the police and fire plan was 113% funded. Now, all the plans were better funded than they are today. Uh, there's a Fresno plan that was 170% funded at the time. But if we roll forward, you can see the, the changes and in the 2008-9 crisis, all of the plans funded status fell. And then they've been slowly working their way back up. But at the same time, we've been reducing our discount rates, our expected return on assets, which makes them more poorly funded and strengthening other assumptions. Uh, so the combination of those uh, things, changing the investment assumption, uh, and trying to recover the investment returns leads us to where we are today. Now, I, I said we have a strong plan to uh, restore funded status. These are the projected city contributions for each of the plans uh, going forward to get us back to uh, full funding. And at the bottom here is the federated pension plan. It's got the, uh, the longest path. Uh, it's only 57% funded now. We have uh, a $2 billion shortfall to close. And so the, the current contributions are just above 200 million. We're looking at those increasing gradually uh, over time until we get uh, very well funded. Uh, in the late 2030s, and then 2040, uh, we look for a significant drop in contributions. Police and fire, it happens more quickly. Uh, it's better funded now. Uh, it's on a very rapid pace to pay off uh, an unfunded liability. And then the OPEB plans are small pieces on top. If you just look at the, the pension, you can see we hit the hit the peak in at the end of this decade and then start a decline. That decline is 
being led by a steep drop that's projected in contributions for the police and fire plan. The federated pension plan, uh, we're expecting contributions to continue at a fairly strong level uh, till 2040. Now, if you're managing, that's a quick overview of where we are and what we're expecting. I'm gonna uh, go a couple layers deep and then come back. Uh, and in managing the pension plans, there are really three types of policies that uh, control the plan. The benefit policy is what the city and the unions negotiate, what the benefits are gonna be, uh, <laughs> There are certain uh, requirements for voter approval for changes, um, but that's between the, the city and the unions and the retirement boards are, are not really directly involved in that process. Retirement boards, however, uh, control the investments, uh, and that really affects, uh, in the short term, the expected costs. Uh, in the long term, it affects the actual costs, which are really dependent on those investment returns and it, look, it affects the potential range of costs for the plan. And then there's the contribution policy, which uh, is really my role with the boards uh, to determine what the timing and amount of contributions will be given our investment returns. And so we develop uh, that contribution policy and pattern, and that's what uh, drives the contributions we request from the city. The basic structure of a pension system has not changed. Uh, this uh, graphic is from the Harvard Business Review in 1965, and we still use it today because you know, it still works. Uh, the key thing to understand is that our fundamental equation is over time, over the life of the pension plan, all the contributions plus all the investment earnings have to add up to the benefits paid and the expenses paid. So there's really only two sources of revenue to pay for the benefits uh, that have been promised and earned. And so whatever we don't get from investment earnings, we have to make up for in contributions. And so if we get great investment returns, it will ultimately reduce the contributions. If we get poor investment returns compared to what we expected, uh, we will have to increase contributions. There's really just those two sources, and, and that's the, the dynamic and balance and, and um, issues that uh, we struggle with. So we have been showing just the contributions, but uh, really the expected investment returns are quite significant. So the um, prior chart we just showed what the contributions we expect from the city. We also get contributions from the members uh, to build the plan. Um, but the expected investment returns are more significant than those contributions. Uh, and if we don't get what we expect, those get pushed back into the contributions over some period of time. We don't take an immediate loss and have to pay it all at once, but it builds into the contributions. The other thing I would note here is if you, if you just look at the investment returns, the police and fire plan on the left and the federated plan on the right, you can see that the police and fire plan is currently uh, much more dependent on those expected investment returns. It's got more assets, and so we expect more investment returns. Um, but that means its contributions are gonna be more sensitive to differences between what we expect the investment return to be and what it actually is. Now, when we set contributions um, or 
the members and the city. The first piece uh, is something we refer to as the normal cost. And that is the cost of the current year of service for active members. So benefits attributable to that current year of service. And so there's a couple things to note here about that cost. We normally express it as a percentage of pay. And the, the tier one costs, this is police and fire here and federated over here. The tier one costs uh, are larger than the new tier two costs, like by a fair amount. Uh, the tier one benefits were more generous with uh, earlier retirement, higher multipliers, higher colas. Uh, and so those benefits cost more. And the, um, the split between the city and the member also changed between tier one and tier two. In tier one, the members pay three elevenths of the cost and the city pays eight elevenths of the cost. In tier two, the costs are split 50-50. So uh, what we are seeing is over time, that normal cost is going down as we have more tier one members retire and the city hires more tier two members uh, to replace them. So those costs are gradually going down over time. If we look at them as a dollar amount, uh, you can see for federated, the tier two costs are actually uh, in combination, they're higher than tier one. The city's tier one contribution is still higher. Um, Police and fire is less far along in uh, the transition between tier one and tier two. And so those costs uh, are still similar uh, to just the, the percents that you saw in the prior slide. Uh, but over time, you're gonna see the costs shift from tier one to tier two, and that will be a lower percentage of pay. But the last piece we put on is a payment to pay for the unfunded liability. And that is far and away the largest cost. And uh, while on tier two, the members would pay 50% of that cost, in tier one, the city pays all of it. Tier two's young, and there really isn't uh, a UAL associated with tier two. It's all associated with tier one. And so if we were 100% funded instead of two thirds, there'd be over $300 million in contributions that would go away uh, because we wouldn't need it because we'd be fully funded. So we are uh, putting $300 million, over $300 million uh, this year just towards paying off that unfunded liability. Just one more comparison to other California retirement systems here. Uh, we put in uh, the total normal cost rates for, uh, you can see the police and fire and the federated. Most of the other uh, systems have some combination of general members and safety members. And so we created the yellow dot to be the, the city of San Jose as a whole. To, to blend them, uh, to provide a more apt comparison. And so you can see that the total normal cost blended is, is uh, above average, uh, but it is coming down as you shift from tier one to tier two. The employee contribution rates, uh, you're about average with an average rate of about 10%. But the employer contribution rate, uh, you're among the highest in the state. Uh, and that reflects federated being the lowest funded in the state 
and really a strong policy towards paying down that unfunded liability uh, and getting it paid off. These things also reflect uh, that we use a lower discount rate, a lower expected return on assets, which increases our expected costs. So if you look at those California systems, uh, the most common rate is 6.75, um, but there are a lot of systems at 7%. Uh, we're at six and five eighths for both the federated and police and fire. And uh, we used to be the, the lowest discount rate in the state, but uh, several of the systems have uh, now caught up and actually a few are, are lower, uh, but we're still um, below most systems. One more thing on paying down the UAL, this chart, the line shows the measure of the unfunded liability projected over time and the bars are the payments. And this is looking at police and fire. And so you can see uh, in 2024 and 2025, we're gonna be paying about 140 million uh, to, towards the UAL. We're paying 145 in the current fiscal year. But if you go out about five years, the UAL is projected to have dropped to 870 million from 1.2 billion. Fairly significant uh, pay down of the UAL. And five years after that, uh, it's really dropped dramatically down to about 356 million. So we are um, paying this down fairly rapidly. Federated, uh, it's a similar story, but uh, we are starting a little bit more slowly. Uh, so by in the next five years, uh, we would be reducing it from about 2 billion to 1.8 billion. And then after that, it starts uh, dropping much more quickly uh, down to 1.3 billion by 2033. Now that's assuming all of our assumptions are met, everything goes according to plan uh, and all of that. And we know that that is not the case. So I wanted to uh, just give you some sense of how sensitive these projections are uh, to investment returns. So this is that same chart I started with um, uh, early in the presentation with our total contributions peaking at 523 million in 2029 uh, before they, they start to go down. That assumes we get a six and five eighths percent return each and every year. So we created um, two scenarios for you to, to consider. Uh, one, the optimistic scenario that assumes we get a 10% return uh, for each of the next five years. And I'd suggest you watch the, um, watch the 2034 number. So this is 461 with the expected return. At a 10% return, that drops to 313 million. So that's a $130 million difference there. If instead we had the pessimistic version where we get a 2% return for each of the next five years, uh, that would increase that number to 657. So that, again, it's over a $300, $340 million difference between the optimistic and pessimistic returns. And you can look at that at 2029, which uh, is really based on uh, evaluation five years from now, from 632 to 432. So a $200 million difference in the city's contribution uh, just on that range of investment returns. And we know they could 
investment returns can be much better than that. We had in 2021 um, much better returns on the order of 27, 28%. Uh, and then in 2022, uh, we had worse returns that were um, down below zero. So uh, these aren't the extremes, but uh, kind of the, the middle range of our expectations uh, for what uh, you can expect. So I just wanted to wrap up with, uh, I think I, the slide will come up here with uh, those themes again. Uh, the plans, uh, including the OPEB plans together are about 66% funded, uh, but we are expecting that number to improve each year. Uh, we know contributions are high. They're about 472 million for fiscal year end 2024. Um, those high contributions are to pay off that unfunded liability that's uh, mostly for uh, the benefits for tier one members who uh, have mostly retired. We expect gradual increases in the contributions if all uh, actuarial assumptions are met, uh, but there's really a wide range of possibilities depending on what actual investment returns are. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions people may have. Great, thank you so much. That was really informative. Especially appreciate seeing those scenarios at the end. I think that's really helpful context. So we're gonna open it up to council discussion, colleagues, and thank you all for being here. Um, I think because we don't have our fancy hand raising system, I'll just ask you to put your tent card like this if you'd like to. <laughs> jump in it's probably the easiest way to do it i saw councilor torres was waving me down earlier so i don't not to put you on the spot but do you want to kick us off with with some questions i i have a bunch written down but we can i i can yield some time to my uh colleagues if i keep asking them but uh so in the in the presentation the funded ratio for the retirement systems I liked how you play or played around with the, the years. Obviously, you went all the way to, shoot, I'm talking like if he's here, out there on Zoom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, uh, if, um, if, I think if you can go back to it. So we, you're, you're obviously going back to 2007 because that was right before pension, the pension fight that the city had, right? Well, it, it, 2007 was a peak for many pension systems, not, not just San Jose. Okay, but is- uh, It's before the financial crisis. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I know I just made you jump to it, um, and I, I'm sorry. What I meant to say is, is if you can go back to the one where you had them all in one, the contribution rates for uh, California retirement systems, uh, which is I think slide 12, can you also do two, 2007 for all three of those? Can you play around with, or do you have to do it separately? Uh, I, I don't have that information built in here. Uh, we can certainly follow up with that, um, but you're right. The Well, the city's contribution rates would be much lower uh, compared to uh, both in an in an absolute sense and compared to other systems. Okay, so I, I, I squiggled a question here and I, and I hope I can read my own writing. Uh, my question is for the for slide four, would this, would this gap look different? Would this gap look different if we, if we didn't have pension, the pension reform that we did in 2009 or 10, whatever year it was. Would this, gra would this gap look uh, uh, significantly different uh, if we didn't have the pension reform fight of uh, 2009? Yeah, so the, the pension reform uh, reduced the costs. Uh, and so where we would have come out in terms of funded status 
is a little bit unclear because we would have required more contributions in the interim uh, and your liabilities would have been higher. Uh, but I think the, the pension reform definitely uh, reduced the, the costs to the city uh, in that interim period. The right. pension reform did not do anything for paying off the legacy liability other than create more space for um, higher contributions to go towards that legacy liability. Right. And so we obviously, and we obviously see that in slide 10, right? We're yes. Right. With the, the components of the contribution, how it, it, it equals and levels off for our city, yeah. right. In the, in that slide. It's uh, probably better in slide nine where you're looking at a percent of pay. Yeah. And that's where that's where actually I was going for next. Thank you. Uh, do we know how many active tier one city employees we still have? Because I'm actually tier one and I haven't retired, so just letting you know. Right. <laughs> no, we definitely have. <laughs> just we like definitely a, do have problem. active uh, tier one, um, and you can. I don't have the number right in front of me. It's in our valuation reports, uh, but you can see uh, we're still collecting. $9.4 million a year from tier one members in federated uh, and 15.9 million a year from tier one members in police and fire. Yeah, no, no. So, so my question, and I, I can probably get them offline is how many active tier ones for police and fire we have, how many are retired, same thing for tier two, and then obviously same thing for the federated pension. So I can, I could always get that from, uh, from you, right? But, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, is there if there's a chat function, I can put them. I can look them up after I'm off the presentation and put the answer in there. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, we're we're not on Zoom, but we'll get it somehow. <laughs> okay, yeah. Bill. If you can forward that to me, and I'll, I'll make sure that it's uh, is made available to the to the city council. I, by the way, um, you are so lucky that I will, I'll be back before you next week <laughs> right. to talk about the actuarial report uh, results for 2022. So you're going uh, to gonna hear some of these uh, to a less extent, but I can actually touch base on, on those, some of those questions and some of that data with my presentation. Great. And I, and I just have two more comments after this, I promise, colleagues. Uh, and I don't know who these questions should be directed. I think maybe they will be directed to Roberto because... The individual on Zoom is our consultant, right? For the pension plans, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, how would, if, you know, if our economy were to, to tank again, like it did in 2007, how would layoffs uh, affect, uh, how would mass layoffs affect uh, our pension plans? Because I saw we went up until 2043. How would mass layoffs affect, affect uh, our pension plans? Massive layoffs, I should say. Bill? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Oh. <laughs> Do you want to take that one? I mean, what what is that? I, I think the council member is asking actually the actual impact. Um, then if we have layoff for the city, which decreases the amount of contributions by the employees, obviously. But do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah. So the there are a complex web of impacts. Uh, it, first, uh, we would collect fewer contributions uh, from members. We would uh, also have some lower liabilities because we are assuming that these people will continue to work and earn uh, larger benefits. But having said that, about 70% of the liability uh, or 67%, I think for federated is for people who have already retired. And so the reduction in liability would not be that significant. Uh, presuming that the massive layoffs are because the city does not have revenue, uh, that would be a very significant concern for us because as you saw, a big part of our contribution that we're trying to collect is to pay uh, that unfunded liability. And so anything that uh, severely impacts the city's uh, revenues and budget 
uh, also has an impact on us and concerns us about our ability to collect those contributions. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and um, so as we talk about filling vacancies here in our city of San Jose, and I know, and I know that uh, that's been a big, uh, that's been a, a, lots of, you know, concerns from, from, my, from my colleagues about vacancies. When we're trying to fill in these vacancies and they're former full-time folks in our city, if they were tier one and they get rehired, or I think we even have that retirement uh, uh, program where the, I don't know what to call it, semi-retired folks could come in and work for a little bit, right? If there's a lot of work that our city has, uh, do they come back into the, the same tier that they left? So if a tier one, or just for example, uh, somebody quit long time ago and was tier one and was, was to come back uh, as a city, city employee again, will they be hired under tier one or they'll be hired under tier two? Um, so generally speaking, what will happen is if, if you were a tier one member and left the city for another jurisdiction and you come back to the city, you are considered uh, a, a legacy uh, legacy member, which means that you go back, when you join the city, you go back to tier one. Uh, if in turn you refer to the retired members, uh, I believe, and obviously the city is here, so if I misspeak, please correct me. Um, they do have a program that they have a retiree rehire. Yeah. That means these are members that have already retired and are receiving a pension from the system, in which case they just will be working to help. Uh, they get paid, but they are limited in terms of the number of hours they can work a year, and they don't they don't really are, they do not become part of the plan. So there's not any extra liability uh, for that either. Okay. Um, and if, if, if you'd like, I do have the member counts now. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll look those numbers. So in the police and fire plan, there are 966 tier one members who are active. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's 780 tier two members who are active. There are 348 uh, members. I don't have the split between tier one and tier two, but there are people who are no longer working for the city and are entitled to a benefit in the future, but not receiving one today. Uh, and then the largest group is 2,518 members who are currently receiving benefits. As retirees? As retirees. Cool. Uh, and then uh, my last question, I promise. Do you want the same numbers for federated? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot. I forgot we have two pension plans. Yes. <laughs> what is the federated one? Uh, so active federated uh, tier one is 1,292. Tier two is 2,500. Uh, the no longer working but not receiving benefits is 1,890. And then the group uh, members receiving benefits is 4,557. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for those. And then my last question, I, I promise before I yield my time, is I'm a visual person, so correct me if I'm wrong. In the in slide 14, that's so that's it. What I'm seeing here is by 2043, we would have paid off uh, the unfund, unfunded liability. Yes, if all of our assumptions are met. All right. So th this is the schedule assuming that everything goes exactly as expected, including earning six and five eighths percent each and every year. Okay, great. Thank you. Council member, yeah. I just wanted to clarify something that Roberto said. And just to give you a little more detail on the rehired retirees, we can use them up to 960 hours oh, per year. I think you were going there with that question. And if they were to exceed <laughs> that, then they would jeopardize their retirement benefits. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Right.
Thanks, Nelson. Remember, <laughs> great questions. <laughs> Not seeing any tent cards up. Anybody else have questions? No? I'll just ask, are we seeing other jurisdictions do anything innovative that we should be looking at as a city in terms of paying down either increase? I know we've talked about pension obligation bonds, which I have my own concerns about, but would be a decision of the council, but ways of accelerating payment into the funds or reducing obligations on the other, the other side, buying people out of their healthcare benefits. I mean, are there, is there any solutions we're seeing out there that we should be considering or have we, have we tried everything and this is just kind of the flight path we're on at this point? Uh, I think largely it is the flight path you're on um, because of the legacy uh, issues. I think the, the new-ish thing uh, for new plan designs uh, is to include more risk sharing features. Uh, you have some risk sharing in terms of the contributions in tier two, um, but a lot of the other designs are uh, adjusting benefits um, in terms of the risk sharing to control the volatility of the costs. Can you say uh, the issue is you can't do that with the legacy liability. And so that's why I say you're largely on the um, um, you're on this path. Right. Can you say a little more about the risk sharing that you just referenced that you're seeing other cities do? Forward, forward looking, of course. Yeah, so they're uh, they're uh, restricting it based on funded status. But but I should point out that risk sharing goes both directions. I mean, so if the plan does well, they pay much higher colas. Uh, yeah. And if the plan does poorly, they pay uh, little or no cola. Right, okay. And then on the healthcare costs specifically, I don't know what the rules are, but are retirees legally allowed to enroll in Medicare? And if they did, would there be a world in which we could pay them for part of the savings of doing that as an in to incent them to do that as a way of reducing our long-term obligations? Is there kind of a win-win potentially for the city and the employee if they were to enroll? Well, the, the retirees who are eligible for Medicare, I, I believe they are required to enroll. They're required. Okay. Got it. All right. Just thinking of a creative angle here for reducing our problem, <laughs> but I'm not the Yeah, person. but your your big liability is still the, the tier uh, one pension liability. Understood. Yeah. Okay. All right, colleagues, I've been stalling as long as I can. If there's nothing else. Uh, Roberto, was there anything else on item one that you wanted to cover or should we move on? Um, no, no, there, there was there was nothing else. Again, I'll be before you, uh, City Council next week to um, present just the 2022 results. So certainly I'm happy to answer any questions there as well uh, about the actual evaluation. Uh, I think the last comment that I'd like to make about this, and I don't know, Bill, if you have any, any um, slides on it. Uh, one of my goal was to to sort of uh, connect the actuarial uh, information with uh, the presentation by our chief investment officer and some of the trustees in terms of the asset allocation, and that have to do with uh, the ratio of active members to retirees and the sensitivity that that brings to the plans. Uh, I wanted to make the connection because uh, uh, we'll, we make that statement every year when I come before you for the evaluation, and so does Prabhu when he comes to present investment results, uh, which has impacted the, the board's thinking in terms of the asset allocation and, and the risk profile that they actually implement when selecting that asset allocation, uh, meaning that because of the high ratio uh, of both of the plans compared to the peers across the state, it makes for a highest sensitivity to market fluctuations, which means that uh, when we have great returns, it's awesome for the plans, but when we have bad returns, it's actually more painful for the plans. And because of that, the boards have made a conscious decision over time to limit the risk profile of both plans through the selection and the implementation of the asset allocation. Uh, but I'll leave the concept to our CIO, uh, who is uh, obviously 
uh, uh, very well educated in that area and can speak more, more eloquently about it than I can. So thank you. Great. Thank you. So that's a perfect transition to item two and probably we'll pass it over to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members, trustees. Good afternoon. Uh, so our presentation will again be some 30, 35 minutes long, and then we'll open it up for questions. The last time we, we made a presentation to the joint um, city council board meeting, uh, we addressed some specific topics because at the time the council, the composition of the council was different. You were somewhat familiar with our investment program and there were some specific concerns and we, we addressed that. Now, since the majority of the council is new, uh, this is going to be sort of an investment 101. And so it's certainly not our intention to talk down to anyone but we are going to uh, explain some fundamental concepts. We and... all appreciate the remedial course. <laughs> <laughs> but I know some of you are very sophisticated, so bring on the questions. Um, but we'll start with uh, Chairman Lanza, who's been here uh, longer than any other trustees, like a dozen years, I think. And so he'll, he'll give sort of a historical overview of the plans and uh, what got us here. And I will then talk about our current asset allocation and why we manage our portfolios the way we do. And that'll be followed by Trustee Chandra, who's the chair of the Federated Investment Committee on our results. And then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, with that, over to Trustee Lanza. And I'm right. hoping that somebody can, can drive the slides for us. Um, Is it possible, Tony, to have someone from, thank you. There you go, Great. Drew, thank you. Right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why PNF is unique. That's fine. <laughs> We're in Zoom hell. And next slide. We're going to go really fast. So, um, disclaimers first of all, I'm going to take you on a journey with me because I've been on this board for 12 years. Of the 16 trustees, there's only one other trustee that was in this room with me on March 2011 when the city, I think, wisely decided they need some help from independent members. That's my friend, Dick Santos, who also joined the board in March of 2011. I am not a financial expert. I'm not a pension expert. I'm not a government expert. I do, but what's that famous movie? I do have a unique talent, right? I'm a recognized expert in building and sustaining high-function teams. And at the time, wisely, I think, the, the council, the mayor, and the system said, we're going to be building a new team where we haven't had one before. Let's bring in a guy like Lonza. So they went looking for me. I went looking for them. And the rest is, I think, a happy coincidence. Now, in the next five or 10 minutes, I'm going to pull a rabbit out of a hat. That's the second sentence here. I don't think my fellow trustees are going to agree that's what I just did. I don't even think our consultants are going to agree that's what I just did. I'm not sure you're going to agree that's what I just did, but I think it's what I'm going to do. Next slide. So the journey of building high-function teams is, is a learning journey. You learn other people. You learn challenges and so on. No disrespect to you, I decided to tell this as sort of a cartoon story in stick figures. So you guys are the progenitors, the city council, Mayor, you're the grandparents, the boards are the parents, and the systems, PIF and Federated, Police and Fire and Federated, are the children, our consultants are the teachers and principal, and there's this odd, quirky character, this tutor called Alpha. Next slide. Next slide, uh, hang on. Uh, so when we showed up, it was very, very clear that there was a horrible debacle in 2007, 8, 9. Now, we all know we lived through it. There was a horrible debacle. It was the real estate crisis. But that crisis, and Bill sort of showed you this, hit San Jose harder than it hit similar pension systems. We had no idea why. We're brand new. Well, we do what you do when you're building a high-function team. You shoot everybody. So Bill joins us one or two months after I join. Over the next three to four years, we replace our legal counsel, we replace our CEO, we replace our financial advisors, and then we replaced our CIO after we'd replaced all them. We had no idea if that was the right thing to do, but the general rule of thumb is when 
a group in an army loses a battle, you take everybody out. The soldiers, the generals, the lieutenants, the sergeants. Next slide. Next slide. A lot of this is just filler in case you want to read standalone. Uh, next slide. Okay. So police, it turns out in this 12 year journey, thank God, thank you, Bill. God, thank God for Bill. Bill says at the very first meeting with him, hey, you guys know you're different, right? Police and fire, you get this. And you've seen the slides. And of course, being new, we're like, okay, well, he's, he came highly recommended, so we're listening. Pitt, what Bill tells us in the vernacular of this cartoon is that Piff is abnormally sensitive to his grandparents. In the specific, Bill tells us that the city of San Jose is abnormally sensitive to the performance of the police and fire pension fund. You've seen some of that already. That's why we had Bill go first. Next slide. So this is Bill's slide. Now look, I'm, I'm a trained engineer. And that black dot on the right and left is police and fire. As a trained engineer, when you see a slide and it talks about a population and you're an outlier, you either think, great, we're all going to get rich, or holy crap, we're all going to die, right? It turns out it's neither one of those. It just says we are very abnormal, and therefore our challenge is to work with you to compensate for that. Next slide. It turns out Federated is very normal. It's a little underfunded, okay? But it's pretty normal, thank God, pension system. Good for all. Next slide. It would take, it has taken me 12 years to understand this, and I'm not stupid, so I can't explain this to you in an instant. But it's possible to compensate for the fact that you're oversensitive to us by reducing the risk in our investment portfolio. Unfortunately, risk and return are related. And so when we lower that risk, we lower that return. And it looks like that's, um, that's the uh, rate of return, the discount rate, the actual rate of return, for the peers on the left, the police fire on the right. And when you sort of defocus your eyes, you say they're virtually the same, right? And as you heard, they almost are. The median California plan now is at about 7%, and we're at 6 and 5 eighths. So it's pretty dang close. But let me tell you, that 3 eighths of a percent, I think, is $20 million a year, you guys, maybe more. So it's pretty, sig it's pretty significant. This is now the end of the year 2011. And the conclusion we reach is that it wasn't that the trustees had a bad plan in 2008. In fact, they had pretty much the same plan as every other pension plan in California. The problem was that was the wrong plan, given that we're an outlier. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pull a rabbit out of a hat, but I have to tell you that the impetus for us having the same rate of return, the same discount rate as our peers, is not some wonderful intellectual exercise. To be damned honest, as a trustee and the rest of we got tired of answering the question, why do you suck? Why is everybody else at 7.5% and you're at 7 and a quarter? I swear to God, every pension conference, you walk in, they laugh. I'm not making this up. They would laugh and say, you suck. And we're like, no, we are unique. <laughs> All right. So I, I, some of you know Vince Sanzeri. At the end of 2011, Sanzeri and I go out and have beer, and Sanzeri says, I think we can simultaneously have a lower risk, lower return core plan, but an overall plan that returns the same as our peers. That, ladies and gentlemen, is pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Let me show you how we're going to do it. And we have actually, in fact, done it. Uh, next slide. I am not a finance guy. Vince says, and I'm not going to explain this to you, he says, if beta is an immovable rock, you add alpha. If for those of you that know finance, you know what I just said. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. That's why we had the meeting over beer. We went looking to build a team that could generate this mysterious alpha theme. And so we reached out and recruited and hired uh, Prabhu Palani. Now, I'm not actually pulling the rabbit out of the hat. 
Prabhu and his team are pulling the rabbit out of the hat, but since they work for me, I'm going to take credit for it. Okay, next slide. All right. So in life, you guys get this, right? Everything is kind of graded on a curve and graded in absolute, right? I, I, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. Right on a curve, or it's just me. I damn well better outrun the bear. So in the beginning, we started incrementally lowering our discount rate an eighth of a percent per year just to say we should probably have a lower discount rate than our peers because we are an outlier. We're more sensitive to risk. Well, that's grading on a curve. And that may sound stupid to you, except there have been a lot of studies on crowds have more wisdom than the best experts in the world. It's called the wisdom of crowds. Right, And so we assumed that the rest of the pension systems had the right number for them, and therefore the right number for us would be slightly lower. In 2018, Eileen over there from Barris, one of our consultants playing the role of principal, said, I think we can help you actually figure out what the absolute number you should aim for is. And next slide. So we, we had an offsite at the Hayes Mansion, and the answer came back, I think we can calibrate this. So in any given downturn of 2008, of 2022, 2023, the city of San Jose will feel the same pain as its peers. And how we do that, we'll have a lower discount rate, lower the risk. So as the market goes down, we will feel less pain. And you can see it, it's happened this time, Peru could tell you. We have lost less in this downturn than just about any other pension plan state, which means we gain less when the years are up. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So it's probably driven you guys a little crazy that we have a lower discount rate, and therefore you have to pay us more money. It certainly bugs us that we go to conferences and people say we suck. But the reality is every previous mayor, Mayor Reed, Mayor Ricardo, and council has said, yeah, dang, but you're doing the right thing because that, man, we never want to, I mean, the city almost went bankrupt after 2008, right? And, and so, uh, next slide. So I'm going to read what uh, Professor Alpha says. Your report card will continue to show lower grades in core subjects, that's, the bulk of our investments, that's a lower, port, a lower risk portfolio, lower assets, but higher grades in electives, and therefore your GPA will match your peers. I've used this analogy over the years because GPA kind of makes sense what it is. And so in, in the parlance of beta and alpha, we will choose a lower beta for the core portfolio. We will build alpha on top of that. Next slide. Uh, next slide. This slide is so controversial, I'm sure I'll get beat up in the parking lot after this. I believe, I believe, Drew Lanza, chairman of Police Fire, believes, I'm sure anybody else believes it in this room, that we could right now have a discount rate and a rate of return equivalent to our peers and still have a lower risk portfolio. In other words, in a downturn, the city would say feel the same amount of pain as the city of San Diego, but we would get to 100% funded more quickly, and your contributions would be in the tens of millions less per year. Bill, I know Bill, Bill is, when, thank God Bill's not here because he'd be the one beating me up in the parking lot. And the reason is that little tiny yellow bar on top, the mysterious alpha. It is possible when you pull a rabbit out of a hat to have the tail wag the dog. That little piece of alpha may be enough to make us the same as our, as our peers. Next slide. Right, so 2021, at least I decided it works. I don't know, probably you weigh in, you can say it doesn't. All right, now next slide. Uh, so some of you know we pulled a little stunt off in the year 2020, which added hundreds of unexpected millions of dollars to the portfolio. We triggered alpha. It was very planned, it had been planned for years, and COVID, while COVID may have killed people, I hope nobody in this room lost anybody, while it was painful to people, it was wonderful for our pension system. 
And we had alpha is proven. We did it. It's clearly alpha. So here's the problem, and you're going to hear more about this, Mr. Mayor and City Council, over the course of the year. Alpha is, by definition, what's generated by very, very smart people doing very smart things. And that little slice is not about stocks and bonds. It's about really esoteric asset classes like venture capital. I'm a venture capitalist. Overseas debt, distressed debt. Asset classes where the money is made by the talent of the people dealing with money. I'm a venture capitalist. Good VCs make money. Bad VCs don't. Year after year after year. It's not luck. It's almost all skill. The problem, uh, next slide, and now, now we come to la uh, last year. And the problem is, of course, that we've now built, Prabhu has built a staff that generates alpha. He has pulled a rabbit out of a hat. Now, you may not believe that's what he did. The rabbit is there. It's, it's a number on, the, on, on our report that we generated hundreds of millions of dollars by doing something smart and unusual. Next slide. So this says 2022. It's really today. So hopefully you, the grandparents, say, we're so happy that you did that. You generated all that money and lowered our contributions. And we say, well, we had help. We had Prabhu and his staff. And later on this year, we're going to ask you for help keeping that staff. Now, next slide. Here's why I'm going to get beaten up the part. I'm going to say something. It's just me. It's just true. In the lower left of that chart is a claim. It's a claim. It's a prediction about the future. I believe, look, San Jose is a great city. We've had great city councils, great mayors. I hope we still have one with you folks. If you folks work with us, I believe we can generate the same return, same discount rate as our peers, but have a core portfolio, which means the pain you feel in a downturn will be the same as San Jose, despite all the odd statistics that Bill pointed out. Well, that's not too crazy a claim, but the last slide of this presentation, where I turn back, go to the next slide, is a really crazy claim. I think if we all work together, I know, you, I know I'm going to get beaten up in the parking lot. I think if we all work together, we can have the best pension plan in the state of California. And I think there's some chance, some small chance in a decade, we could have the best pension plan in the entire country. Because any pension plan that generates a higher return for a given risk is a rabbit out of a hat. What do you think, Prabhu? Over to you. All right, thank you, Drew. Uh, never a great idea to sandwich yourself between two great storytellers. Uh, you'll hear from Trustee Chandra next, but I will try my best. Um, so I'm going to talk about our portfolio, our asset allocation currently, if we can go to the next attachment there. Oh. Oh. I, thought I, was only doing, I thought I was only doing that one presentation. Hold on. The, the, this should one. be a PowerPoint, I think. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, if we can go to slide one. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, a chart that looks like the periodic table of elements. I don't know if you can see this, uh, if you can read this. And, and this is very basic, right? Why do we manage a well-diversified portfolio? And I've had these questions before. Why isn't your portfolio entirely in stocks in, US, in the S&P 500? Or why are we taking any risk? Why isn't your portfolio entirely in bonds? And the answer is this chart. So as you can see, there's no asset class. If you look at the top row, that's the best performing asset class every year. And then it's, and it just goes down from there. And you can see no, you know, not more than two years has any asset class done has been the best performing asset class. So in 2022, Commodities was the best performing asset class, right? It returned 16%. But if you look at commodities from 20, if I can read this properly, 2012 all the way to 2015, 
it was the bottom performing asset class, right? So it's very hard to predict. And if you look at US equities last year, it was down 18%. But in other years, it's been the best performing asset class, which is why you want to manage a well diversified portfolio, which takes us to the next slide. And the next slide shows you our current asset allocation. And Drew briefly mentioned this, uh, touched on this. So we, we follow what is called a functional asset allocation. And we have three categories of assets, growth assets, low beta, and other assets. And what's the point of doing this, right? So we have a discount rate of six and five eighths. And so your growth assets are the asset classes that are going to do better than six and five eighths. And so you want the majority of your portfolio to be in those asset classes. And they are public equity, private markets, Drew reference private markets, emerging markets, debt, high yield bonds, and so on. But you also want to keep your risk low, right? You can't put all your money in growth assets. So you want some diversifying strategies. And that's what low beta and other assets do. So what they do is they provide some liquidity to the portfolio. They also provide some diversification benefit to the portfolio. So, you know, in 2018, uh, uh, Chairman Lanza referenced this in his presentation. Veris, our risk consultant, did a study. And they said, you don't want your absolute level of risk to be greater than 12%. So you don't want to fluctuate more than 12%. And that's 12% that's as a standard deviation number, which means two thirds of the time, it will be around that 12% number. Because if it does that, it impacts your sponsor a lot. So, so we try to take risk not more than that 12%. At the same time, we try to maximize returns. So in the process of doing that, we've come up with this asset allocation target. And we came up with this with the help of our consultant, Makita. So you can see that Federated takes a little bit more risk than police and fire, and Chairman Lanza explained why that is so. So you can see growth assets are higher in Federated than police and fire, and low beta assets, which are diversifying assets, are greater in police and fire than Federated. So this is our current asset allocation target, and I'm gonna show you on the next slide how this has changed in the last five years. So five years ago, so it's, I'm on my sixth year uh, as CIO now, uh, but at the end of 2017, we were taking a lot less risk than we are taking now. And part of the reason was the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, and also us not understanding what our right level of risk should be, which is where our risk consultant came in and said, you know, you can actually take a little bit more risk. So, you know, our risk level was about running at about 10%, and they said, maybe you can actually take 12%. And so we waited for our time. So you can see the, the comparison here. Now, unfortunately, we did not have a functional grouping of asset classes back then. Uh, but I can tell you in 2017, our growth assets were about 40%. And today, our growth assets are much higher, or at 75%. And the difference is really bonds. In, in 2017, our bond portfolio for Federated was 33%, as high as 33%. And we've significantly reduced that. And part of this is a better understanding of our risk profile. And, and risk can return, return a style. So the greater the amount of risk that you take, the greater the amount of returns that you can generate. And so we moved to this functional asset allocation to better understand our portfolio. We increased allocations to equities and growth. And we also reduced allocation to high fee asset classes, right? There's some sensitivity around fees and rightfully so. Um, in fact, if you go to our next slide. So one of our uh, former police and fire trustees used to say, the only free lunch in investments is lower fees. And so we made a conscious effort to decrease fees and we did that through a combination of things. We increased our allocation to passive assets. So roughly 50% of our assets today are index assets. And as you all may know, when, you're, when you invest in an index fund, your fees are a lot lower. And the other reason for lower fees is our asset allocation changed. So we decreased our allocation to absolute return strategies or hedge funds, which typically have you know, very high fees. And instead, we substituted that with lower fee alternatives like cash and cash-like investments. 
The third thing is just negotiation. Uh, I have a very good investment team that negotiates hard. And also, you know, our investment consultant, Makita, helps through volume discounts. So if we make the same investments as some of our peers, uh, then Makita can combine it and give us lower fees. So as you can see over time, you look at the combined plans on the right side, our fees in, in 2017 were 81 basis points, and it's come down to about 53 basis points. So it's quite a steep reduction in fees. Uh, those are my prepared remarks, and that'll be a good segue to Trustee Chandra. So you've seen what we've done and why we do it, and he will talk about some of the results. And I know this was went very fast and it was very brief, but I'm happy to take questions after the presentation. Thanks, Prabhu. Um, you could have sequenced me after Drew because I'm going to continue with the secondary schooling metaphor. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the teacher or the parent. I get to give everyone the report card that has been generated by the CIO and his team. And I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, we were probably a C student and uh, we're definitely a solid A student now. So let's, um, let's start with the, uh, of the three charts up there, the one to the left, which talks about the total dollar value added. Can you move to the next chart? Uh, we're not there yet. Oh, Thank sorry. You. I don't have my glass on. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, so the chart to the left. This is the value added uh, to, to uh, both plans. So s over the past three years, this is a trailing three year through uh, January, sorry, July 2022, the fiscal year that ended in July 2020, uh, June 2022. Um, Federated has added $672 million and police and fire $975 million. Uh, so one CIO staff, that is $1.5 billion generated uh, over that, those three years. Um, keeping in mind that this is the result of the changes that Prabhu has talked about that we've implemented. Um, Moving over, to, and by the way, I believe we were in the bottom percentile when I joined uh, as a trustee and became chairman of the investment committee for Federated. Um, we achieved in 2021 top decile performance and for fiscal year 2022, uh, we remain in the top quartile. It's, uh, it's truly a remarkable turnaround. Um, another thing worth noting is um, a, a bold decision that the CIO and, their, and the staff made uh, at the uh, height of uh, the COVID pandemic crisis in March of 2020. Um, a lot of analysis done in concert with our consultants, uh, calling emergency meetings with both boards, preparing us and informing us for an opportunity to readjust our strategic asset allocation to be heavier in growth and take advantage of the downturn in the market that we had experienced at that time. Um, don't know how many plans would have had the temerity to do that, but again, our CIO made a bold decision, support by both boards, and we were able to add $164 million uh, to the federated plan and $131 million to the police and fire, so combined addition of $300 million uh, uh, to our AUM. So moving over to the uh, chart on the right. Drew has explained alpha, I think, sufficiently that I'm not going to try to uh, outdo him. But it's essentially a perform, it's an indication of outperformance against benchmarks. This is the secret sauce Drew was referring to. And as it pertains to our staff, it's their ability to select managers who are able to outperform their peers. And this is precisely what they've done. They've generated $104 million worth of alpha for the federated plan and $151 million for police and fire. And this is net of fees. So after having paid fees, to these high-priced venture capitalists and hedge fund and private equity folks that Drew mentioned, this was the net result for our plan over the last three years. Um, I also want to point out, since we've talked a little bit about risk, it's not present on this slide. Um, we have managed to perform on a risk-adjusted basis, taking less risk than our peers. So there, there are two standards that are used in the industry. One is the Sharp Ratio, and the other is the Sortino. Um, the higher you are, it means that you are performing better on a risk-adjusted basis than your peers. Uh, on a sharp basis, we're in the top quartile, so we're producing top quartile returns by taking top quartile less risk, if that makes sense. Um, and on a Sortino basis, uh, we are in the top decile of risk-adjusted returns. 
So uh, prudence is king, uh, but alpha is really nice when you can get that in concert, which is what we've done over the past three years. And Drew gave you guys a history lesson uh, that, that predates me. Uh, in my five years, I think some of the seminal, seminal work that's been done is to sort of institutionalize this program so it can outlive the trustees, the committee members on, on the ICs, uh, and the CIO and his staff, though I hope they stay for a long time. Um, and a part of that work began <laughs> continuing with the uh, schooling metaphor. Uh, I used to borrow notes from Susie Klepper in seventh and eighth grade because she was much better at school than I was. So uh, we uh, looked at our peers uh, around the globe and the, the Canadians run really uh, good pension plans. So um, we hired a consultant, Cortex, who helped us sort of figure out what best practices might look like for us as a uh, federated plan and police and fire. We did it jointly. Um, a lot of good work came out of that and what I'd like to point out is manager selection is, is, is sexy and these numbers are great, but there's a lot of governance and a lot of infrastructure that's been put in place behind this. Um, namely, uh, changes to governance, changes to our investment policy, changes to the way we approach strategic asset allocation, importantly delegating authority to the CIO and his staff so they can make decisions with, uh, and be adaptable and flexible in doing so. Um, and ultimately, uh, savvy manager selection. Uh, the result of all of this, and of course, there are other factors like, we've in fact increased the discount rate, which increases the unfunded liability status, and while decreasing the discount rate, we've actually been able to improve the funded status over the past three years by more than 10 points. So, um, you know, I get to say this as a parent, I guess, pretty spectacular performance by our staff. Uh, thank you for all the hard work, and that's the conclusion of my comments. I'm happy to take any questions as well. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, that concludes our formal presentation on the investment section. Happy to take questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the presentations, and I, I forget who said it, but certainly a very remarkable improvement. And I uh, just want to thank our CIO, Prabhu, and his team for the great work that they've done. It's really really impressive. Of course, I have to ask the magician if he thinks there are more rabbits in the hat. <laughs> and uh, you know, just to kick things off, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. I I'm curious of this elusive alpha, clearly the strategic reallocation of assets, that, that mix moving away from being so heavy on bonds made a big difference. As you look forward, and I won't ask you to give away the secret sauce, uh, do you continue to see opportunities for alpha that are within our acceptable risk profile? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And also, I want to make a distinction between beta and alpha. Sure. Um, so the, the shift in strategic asset allocation where we went from bonds to, to equities over time uh, was a beta move, right. right? That doesn't necessarily mean that we are better than our peers and picking managers. But that just goes to show how well informed the boards are and how they've taken input from our consultants and said, yes, I think we should take more risk. And that put us at an advantage compared to some of our peers. Now, the fact is we did, in hindsight, you know, luck is better than skill in March 2020. We, we moved very quickly. We took data from our consultants and we made that move, right? That added a tremendous amount of alpha. So what's going to help us going forward in terms of producing that kind of return is market dislocations, right? And we've seen in the last 20 years that market cycles are ever shorter. Now, it's hard to predict what's going to happen in the future, uh, but as long as we have those types of dislocations, it gives us more opportunity to move quickly and faster. And that goes back to our governance, right? The fact that we have delegated authority, the fact that we have well-informed boards, and that we can quickly have board meetings and we can move very quickly. So I, I don't know if the future is, you know, is going to look like the past, but if we have those types of market dislocations, I think we can take advantage of them. Let me add an interesting side note. You'll enjoy this, Mr. Mayor and Council. <clears throat> so we're firing this program up. It's right for Measure G. It's like 2017. And we're still focusing on beta. And after the third year, we notice we have negative alpha. Well, beta is just stocks and bonds. How can you, could we possibly be that unlucky? So we dug into it. And this goes to what uh, Anurik said about blocking and tackling. Turns out we were just slow. We had 
going back to policy preachers that said when the market moved, uh, we take a vote of the investment committee, we take it back to the boards, and the staff was off on vacation. Six weeks later, we'd move. We fixed that in three months. We haven't had negative alpha since. So it's part of it is is you ask where the wraps. Part of the wrap is just mundane. As Anjorg says, it's consistently just being alert and being aware. I think you'd say that's fair, right, Bruce? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to good governance. Yeah. I think our governance is set up in such a way that there are no guarantees, of course, that we should be able to perform well if, if there are serious dislocations in the market. Yeah, I suppose the, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate the, the, the note there. I, I assume while speed to decision is really important, it's also critical that that doesn't increase risk either. So there's, there's I assume, some, some balancing. There. Yes, absolutely. So we're very, very conscious of that 12% risk target that Veris has given us. And so no matter what we do, so what we did in March 2020 was take it from 10 to 12. Yeah. Right. So that was the perfect opportunity to go up to 12. And we've had some very interesting discussions at the investment committee, at the police and fire investment committee recently, on whether we should be decreasing our risk a little bit, mm -hmm. given, given the volatility in the environment. Right. So we're very, very conscious. Everything is driven. We start with the risk yeah. before we look at return. I think that's the most important change in the five year, and with Veris's help, is that we think in terms of risk. We've we've come up with our own risk budget, which has been rigorous analysis informed by Veris's work. And any decision we make to go off script, because we do strategic asset al allocation annually. Uh, Drew has spoken for himself, so I'll speak for myself. I'm not a big fan of changing it annually. Strategic means 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. If you're just a wet reed in the wind every year, you're kind of working against the, the principle of strategic asset allocation. But when these dislocations happen, that's an opportunity. That's what every uh, fund manager, I'm in the venture capital industry the way Drew is, that's what you, you, you salivate and wait for those moments. Um, but as long as you have a discipline, you've got a risk budget within which you're operating, hopefully you won't do crazy things. And, and I don't think we have. Great. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Let me open it up to my Colleagues, I'm not seeing any tent cards up, but <clears throat> council member, do you oh, want to? Sure. Okay, uh, go ahead, council member Batra. Oh, I think everybody's <laughs> mic is on Hello. automatically. Is, Hot mic is mic on the table. Is my my mic on? on? Okay, yeah. um, I just want to be a little clearer on the changes you made to generate this alpha. That's a style of change, right? And it's not that one time those changes are done and that's going to sustain this alpha. Now, you change your risk factor from 10 to 12. So you're saying as the market moves, you may be trying to change the risk lower or higher. Similarly, your allocation may move from stocks to maybe bonds or something other. So to sustain this alpha which you have gotten, you have work to do constantly, it's not a one-time change, you're done, and now we are set to make, what, 104 million or whatever. Right? That's exactly right. I mean, the clock resets, re, you know, sets for us at the beginning of every year. Okay. And so it's, we, it's a clean slate and we start again. Okay, all right. So, so let me add to that. If you, remember, if you listen carefully to my presentation, I said there were two mistakes that the, our previous trustees made in the 07, 08, 09 real estate debacle. One was they didn't recognize we were unique, and Bill showed you the charts. The other one was they didn't recognize that something systemic had happened with inflation. Well, we all know this, right? For those of us with gray hair, right? Remember, the my first mortgage in 1987 was 17% per annum. Yeah, I and we fixed it, right, right? So let me tell you. So I'm a smart guy, and he's a smart guy. And I've known Andrew, he's a smart guy. Guess well, so you look at inflation. And by the way, some of the smartest people on planet didn't see this. If you understand statistics, inflation hit the one sigma point in 2000. It hit the two sigma point in 2004. And by 2007, inflation had been low for a time unprecedented to, since the founding of this country. And they didn't react to that. I mean, Silicon Valley Bank went down for the same reason. Look, infl inflation's nasty, right? And the previous board thought, well, the, the, the future is just like the past. Anyway, your question basically says, how do you see the future? You don't you just ride it and surf it quickly. Okay. Great. So 
in the second part of your change is <clears throat> really that you change your process how quickly you can react to it, which is, which is really the fundamental, because if you didn't have that, you don't have the ability to really generate this uh, alpha, because by the time you assemble your board and all that, opportunity is gone. Okay. All right. Hey, I, thank I, you I, very much, and I'm glad to be sitting among the smart, smarter, <laughs> smart, smarter people. Okay? <laughs> so it might help us at least be able to claim in the evening that we were with smart people. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Can I make a, a just one <laughs> clarification on, on the structural changes, uh, you know, the work that we did to change governance, the policy? It does give us the flexibility to react to a dislocation, but I, I personally wouldn't want to highlight that as th the, the main thing. Um, it's probably the thing that you see embedded in the numbers, but it's a day-to-day, week-to-week, quarter-to-quarter way for us in our governance oversight to manage the CIO and his staff, but also to give them the freedom and the flexibility. Um, and, you know, we moved a battleship two or three degrees. That's all we did. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councilmember. Councilmember Torres. I, I just, uh, I wanted to go back to inflation. Uh, and, and, yeah. <laughs> and anybody could answer this question. I'm, I'm assuming uh, you all know about it. Does, uh, does inflation actually help or hurt us in terms of investment? Yeah. So I can answer that. You, you want some amount of inflation in general, right? Uh, if, if inflation is too high, uh, it eats into your purchasing power, right? And in, if inflation is too low, if you have a deflationary envi environment, then that's going to hurt risk assets. So you basically have to adjust your portfolio according to the inflation scenario that you have. Uh, but what the Fed tries to target, uh, and I'm talking policy here, is a 2% inflation target, right? So, so it all depends on how you construct your portfolio and how we construct our portfolios in anticipation of what's going to happen with inflation. So regardless of the environment, you can have a portfolio that can ride through it. What's, what, what's difficult is change in inflation rather than the inflation level itself. There is a, Roberto, aren't the pensions have a 3% cap COLA, is that right? Most of them do, especially in California, yes. Yeah, and ours does too, right? So, no, so the tier one has yeah. a 3%. And right. It's not really a cap, it's just it's a fixed 3%. It's fixed 3%. Yeah. Yes, and tier two, I think, is I'm looking around the. I believe it's at two percent tied to the CPI. Which correct, two percent tied to the right. CPI in the Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose area. So there is a concrete question to answer your question. In times of low inflation, we get hurt because the historic inflation number going back to 2000, I think, was like 2.2 or 2.3 percent, and yet we were increasing pensions three percent per year. In times of higher inflation. Right, that, that to some extent nourished our benefit. And I'll tell you, we have our great trustee Sunita and I, we had this debate, we're going offline, we're arguing. Is inflation, so there are two regimes of inflation. There's the first post-war period up to 1990, it was about 4%. And the second period we've all lived through from 92 to about two or three years ago, where it was roughly 2.6, 2.7% over that whole time. And it matters deeply which of those two regimes, and Sunita and I are, practically in fisticuffs, arguing which one's going to be next, and no one knows. And we will make that bet, because we're not in the business of betting, but we will prepare, I assume, Prabhu, to benefit no matter how it turns out, right? That, that's the hope, yeah. yes. So, so um, I thank that, I might just add that yeah. it depends on where interest rates are. I mean, we've been in negative real rates, and now that inflation has gone up and the Fed policy changes, and so that will influence our asset allocation, as uh, Prabhu said. Awesome. Okay, so again, I'm a visual person, and that I'm assuming that's why in 2021 and 2022 we are investing more in commodities, right, than anything else, which basically means a lot of a whole slew of stuff, right? Yes, commodities, tips, real estate; these are all hedges against inflation, as are growth equities. Right, and and that's where I was. Uh, uh, that's where I was, I was going next. So, like, what does investing in real estate look like for us? 
so we, we invest in two types of real estate. One is core real estate, which is publicly traded real estate assets, commercial, residential, and so on. And we also invest in the same type of assets through our private equity program. So we have a private real assets program. Okay. Um, we don't invest. We don't invest in like dirty industries, right? Tobacco, oil. We have no restrictions on investments. But we don't. Do. Well, we we are we are in the S and P five hundred, and all S and P. All right. If you're in the S and P five hundred, by by def definition, you are exposed to tobacco companies. Well, we have the Sullivan principle. I didn't. I didn't hear that. Could someone please repeat that? Years ago, years ago, we had those Sullivan restrictions. You need to be closer to the that mic. That was imposed way back when. I don't know if it, to me it was supposed to carry over now. Okay. So is is the is the answer yes or no? If we invest in dirty industries, we do as we participate in the market, especially in the S and P, um, and especially in those passive returns, uh, passive uh, stocks. We are ex have exposure to oil and tobacco companies and everything else. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so I think that that's going to lead me to my closing, my closing comment. Look, so right. We just, we seen a, 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 a rosy picture of, of us paying down our, our unfunded, unfunded, unfunded liability. I think that's very, very important. Very, very important. Uh, However, um, I wholeheartedly believe uh, that for us to continue to have a strong and stable pension system that is, is that we shouldn't be taking advantage of our uh, advantage of the inflation crisis that's happening, but also investing in oil and tobacco. But that's uh, that's uh, those are my two cents, uh, and I'll I'll definitely definitely leave it at that. But uh, you know, I've said it once, I've said it twice on the mic a couple times. It, I guess it is. I guess it is what it is. Well, I, I've been here for 12 years, and that what, so what does that mean? Uh, 12, 120 some odd meetings. And maybe half the meetings we have a closed session being to discuss investments. And not, nothing, you know, nothing like that's ever come up. But we do invest in baskets of stocks, and Philip Morris might be in one of those baskets. Do we invest in Philip Morris? No. Do we invest in a basket that has Philip Morris and 30 other companies? I fill out the annual, are you invested in any of these companies? And the annual thing I say is, I'm. Prabhu says, we spread our money like peanut butter around the planet. They, are you conflicted with what we're doing? I have no idea. I'm probably invested in thousands of stocks. I don't know what I'm invested in. So no, we're not aware that we're investing in that, but I bet Phil Morris is probably in one of those baskets, right? It is in the s well, yeah. as long as it's in the S&P 500. Uh, like Drew said, it's spread out, and you know. But the flip side of it is, you know, clean energy, right? And when we see opportunity in clean energy, we take advantage of that. And in our private program, we have made those investments. That's good. That's good. So, so my last question, follow up. Um, so, is there is there a city policy that prevents us from investing in 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 I, what did I just say? Dirty, dirty industries. I don't know. Not that I'm aware. Thank you. Oh, that's all. Okay. I do think, no, just thinking about this, I think on the city side of our own investments, there's we have some, some policies related to that. Not on uh, the pensions. Not yes, on the I just wanted to Great. clarify that. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. We looked at that last year, I think. On the city yeah. side, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, council member. Colleagues? Rick Grunow, yeah. Deputy Director of Finance. So on the city side. Oh, here comes the answer on the city oh. side. <laughs> on the city side, the investment portfolio, we have uh, an investment policy which specifically excludes uh, some of those industries uh, from, from our investment. So we have a fixed income portfolio, so we do not buy bonds or securities from those industries. Great. And is there a reason why we don't have a policy for our pension? Is it because it's more run? By a third party? We don't. We don't. That's we don't okay. determine the investments. All right. That's their job. That's, That's what the job. boards okay. are for. Other questions, comments, colleagues. Go 
once. Once. Okay. Well, yeah, please. Council. As the uh, representative for the, as a council representative to the police and fire retirement board, I first want to thank you for the uh, uh, retirement board 101, okay. both the first presentation and the second one and the alpha beta and, and your drawings were really fun, but, uh, and I want to thank Prabhu for the uh, really in brilliant investment strategies that have brought us to where we are today, which is in a pretty good place, even though we have substantial unfunded liabilities that we have to consider, but that was really created over years ago and, and continues to accumulate. And eventually you can see it'll be over, but not in my lifetime. But th I wanna thank all the fiduciary, the trustees who on both sides who are fiduciaries to those accounts and their, their fine management of the systems. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, council member. And I'll, I'll echo that. I, I appreciate all the good work that's been done. We're clearly on a much better trajectory from, from a very dark moment. And I know that's due to a lot of the leadership in this room and appreciate you also taking the time to be here today to educate us and answer questions and look forward to working with you all in, in the years ahead. So thank you. And with that, unless we do, uh, Tony, I apologize. We need to go to public comment now. Yes, we need to go to public okay. comment. Okay, we'll have one public comment period. Go ahead. Is there anybody in person? And there are no hands online. Well, with that, y'all got off easy. We are adjourned. <laughs>